be seated. Well, good morning again, everybody. Welcome back to week three of our series we're calling Christmas in the Chaos. So listen, one of the greatest challenges to the Christian faith in our culture, as you're probably aware, is the problem of evil and suffering. And so this is a theme we are bumping up against as we consider uh, our Christmas series and look at the various ways that even the, the story of Jesus' birth comes up against suffering, evil, trouble. And so to, to raise this problem for us a bit somewhat keenly, I want to read you the beginning of this book here. It's a book by uh, a guy named Bart Ehrman. He is a respected New Testament scholar. And this book is called God's Problem, How the Bible Fails to Answer Our Most Important Question, Why We Suffer. So listen to how keenly uh, this challenge can be felt. He writes this on page one. If there is an all-powerful and loving God in this world, why is there so much excruciating pain and unspeakable suffering? The problem of suffering has haunted me for a very long time. It was what made me begin to think about religion when I was young, and it was what led me to question my faith when I was older. Ultimately, it was the reason I lost my faith. This book tries to explore some aspects of the problem, especially as they're reflected in the Bible, whose authors, too, grappled with the pain and misery in the world. To explain why the problem matters so much to me, I need to give a bit of personal background. For most of my life, I was a devout and committed Christian. I was baptized in a congregational church and reared an Episcopalian, becoming an altar boy when I was 12 and continuing all the way through high school. Early in my high school days, I started attending a Youth for Christ club and had a born-again experience, which looking back seems a bit strange. I had already been involved in church, believing in Christ, praying to God, confessing my sins, and so on for years. What exactly did I need to convert from? I think I was converting from hell. I didn't want to experience eternal torment with the poor souls who had not been saved. I much preferred the option of heaven. In any event, when I became born again, it was like ratcheting my religion up a notch. I became very serious about my faith and chose to go off to a fundamentalist Bible college, Moody Bible Institute in Chicago, that's where I went, and Kehlani, where I began training for ministry. I worked hard at learning the Bible, some of it by heart. I could quote entire books of the New Testament, verse by verse, from memory. When I graduated from Moody with a diploma in Bible and theology, I went off to finish my college work at Wheaton, an evangelical Christian college in Illinois, Billy Graham's alma mater. There I learned Greek so I could read the New Testament in its original language. From there I decided I wanted to commit my life to studying the Greek manuscripts of the New Testament and chose to go to Princeton Theological Seminary, a Presbyterian school whose brilliant faculty included Bruce Metzger, the greatest textual scholar in the country. At Princeton, I did both a Master of Divinity degree, training to be a minister, and eventually a PhD in New Testament studies. I'm giving this brief synopsis to show that I had solid Christian credentials and knew about the Christian faith from the inside out in the years before I lost my faith. During my time in college and seminary, I was actively involved in a number of churches. At home in Kansas, I had left the Episcopal Church because, strange as this may sound, I didn't think it was serious enough about religion. I was pretty hardcore in my evangelical phase. Instead, I went a couple times a week to a Plymouth Brethren Bible Chapel, among those who really believed. When I was away from home living in Chicago, I served as the youth pastor of an evangelical covenant church. During my seminary years in New Jersey, I attended a conservative Presbyterian church and then an American Baptist church. When I graduated from seminary, I was asked to fill the pulpit in the Baptist church while they were looking for a full-time minister. So for a year, I was pastor of the Princeton Baptist Church, preaching every Sunday morning, holding prayer groups and Bible studies, visiting the sick in the hospital, and performing the regular pastoral duties for the community. But then... For a variety of reasons I'll mention in a moment, I started to lose my faith. I now have lost it altogether. I no longer go to church, no longer believe, no longer consider myself a Christian. The subject of this book is the reason why. Eventually, I felt compelled to leave Christianity altogether, but I did not go easily. On the contrary, I left kicking and screaming, wanting desperately to hold on to the faith I had known since childhood and had come to know intimately from my teenage years onward. But I came to a point where I could no longer believe. It's a very long story, but the short version is this. I realized I could no longer reconcile the claims of faith with the facts of life. In particular, I could no longer explain how there can be a good and all-powerful God actively involved with this world given the state of things. 
For many people who inhabit this planet, life is a cesspool of misery and suffering. I came to a point where I simply could not believe there's a good and kindly disposed ruler who's in charge of it. The problem of suffering became for me the problem of faith. After many years of grappling with the problem, trying to explain it, thinking through the explanations that others have offered, some of them pat answers, charming for their simplicity, others highly sophisticated and nuanced reflections of serious philosophers and theologians, after thinking about the alleged answers and continuing to wrestle with the problem, about nine or ten years ago, I finally admitted defeat, came to realize I could no longer believe in the God of my tradition and acknowledge that I was an agnostic. I don't know if there is a God, But I think that if there is one, he certainly isn't the one proclaimed by the Judeo-Christian tradition, the one who is actively and powerfully involved in this world. And so I stopped going to church. So I hope you I hope you hear the 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 heartfelt sort of honesty in that. Like I respect Bart Ehrman a lot. He is a top-notch New Testament scholar. And notice he was one of us, a committed, conservative evangelical Christian. And what happened? He came face to face with this very difficult challenge of the problem of evil and suffering. And he ended up walking away from the faith in Jesus, as many others have. How do we wrestle with this as people who believe in Jesus and believe the answers of the Bible? So there's a lot to say on this subject. And we can't get to everything today, but we'll try to touch on one aspect of it. As we look afresh at Matthew's story of the birth of Jesus, we're going to see that the Bible, as Ehrman admits, the Bible is very forthright about the reality of evil and suffering and injustice in the world. And so interestingly, Jesus himself was born into just such a setting. And so today we'll consider these continued themes of disruption, disaster, and destruction in the story of the birth of Jesus as we wrestle a bit with this larger question of the problem of evil and suffering. So go ahead and grab your outline, if you happen to get a bulletin, and we will begin looking at Matthew chapter 2 as we continue his account of the story of the birth of Jesus. Okay, so here's part one of this passage we're going to look at today, calling this disruption. Occultists seek the king. Matthew chapter 2. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Okay, we read about the story of Jesus' birth last week, and Matthew says here that Jesus is born during the days of the King Herod the Great. Now, uh, at our best reckoning, Herod the Great dies in the year 4 B.C., So Jesus is born sometime before that. So that leads to the somewhat embarrassing situation that Jesus is born at least four years before Christ. But it's okay. Our calendar's a little off. No big deal. Look, Matthew says, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who was born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Now this is a surprise. If you and I are Christians reading this for the first time, this is not at all what we'd expect. Why? Why? Because this category of magi is profoundly non-Christian. Okay, Christians don't want anything to do with, in fact, what the magi represent. Magi is not a Christian category. What's going on here? Who are the magi? The magi are a caste of Persian priests who specialized in astrology, dream interpretation, and often magical arts. Okay, if the magi are Persian priests... What God are they priests of? They are not priests of the one true God of Israel. Okay? These are pagan astrologers. And so, so interestingly, here's another example where our Christian Christmas traditions have just been so wrong so much of the time. We often think of these guys as kings, right? This this arose very early and we get the song, right? We three kings of Ori, right? These are not kings in any sense. We'd better to do, do better to think of these three as magicians or wizards, okay? So this is Gandalf, Dumbledore, and Merlin coming to look for Jesus. This is very surprising. This is not what we would expect if we are early Christians. And it says here, um, they see a star in the sky. 
And, and they follow this. So this, this confirms, because of course magi are astrologers, so they pay attention to astral signs in the heavens. What is this star they have seen? If you read about this, there's a variety of fascinating suggestions. There's complex astronomical reckoning. Well, maybe it was a conjunction of this planet and this planet and this date in this astrological sign. Um, some people have said there seems to be a record of a supernova happening around this time in ancient Chinese astronomical records. and Maybe that's what it was. I don't know. I don't know much about astronomy, so I'm kind of at a loss there. There's a bunch of fascinating possibilities. We don't know for sure, but apparently these guys some saw, saw some sort of star appear in a certain way in a certain constellation, which they interpreted to mean, hey, there's a new king that is born in Judea. Now, some people say this is clearly just fiction. This is just Christians making up and padding the story of the birth of Jesus to make it look impressive. Well, I don't know. I suppose that's possible. But if you are an early Christian making up the story of Jesus, are you really going to select the category of magic user? Astrologer? Astronomer? Well, astrologer would be the better term. Is this the people you're going to pick to come and pay first homage to Jesus? Um, the Magi, this term is used of Daniel's enemies in Daniel as he faces the magic users of, of the Babylonian court there. Uh, this, is, this term Magi is used of Paul's enemies. He faces down a practitioner of black magic in the book of Acts. So this is not at all what we are expecting if the Christians are just making this up in a way that would be most suitable to them. Additionally, we have examples of actual groups of magi traveling in the first century to pay homage to new rulers. So we have a record of a delegation of magi that did come from the east to Rome in the year 66 to visit the emperor Nero. So here's an ancient writer, Pliny the Elder, who describes this and talks about it. Pliny died in the eruption of Mount Vesuvius, which I think is what, 80, if I remember right? So he's writing very early. He says this, the magi have certain subterfuges. He hates magicians. He hates magic, so he hates magi. For example, the gods neither obey nor appear to those with freckles. That's troubling to me. <laughs> Was this perhaps why they stood in Nero's way? Tridatus the magus, magus, there's the singular, mage, had come to Nero bringing captives for the emperor's Armenian triumph over himself and to this end put a heavy burden on the provinces. He refused to travel by sea, for the Magi consider it sinful to spit into the sea or defile its nature by any other human function. He brought the Magi with him and initiated Nero into their magic banquets. Yet although Tridentides had given Nero a kingdom, he was unable to teach him the art of magic. This should be sufficient proof that magic is ex execrable. I don't even know that word. Execrable. Achieving nothing and is pointless. And he goes on to talk more about some of the specific magical practices of the Magi. So again, strange to think of a Christian making this up. We do have precedent of this category of priest, magician, astrologer traveling uh, to kings. So I don't think there's any reason not to expect this happened. Very strangely, very curiously, this group of Magi shows up seeking this new king born in Judea. Uh, there's another interesting possibility, too, in where these guys came from. So on the screen, here's a quote out of a book by a guy named Kenneth Bailey. He was a New Testament scholar and a career lifelong missionary in the Middle East. Spent a lot of time in little Middle Eastern villages. villages. He writes this. In the 1920s, a British scholar, E.F.F. F. Bishop, visited a Bedouin tribe in the Jordan. This Muslim tribe bore the Arabic name Al-Kokobani. The word Kokob means planet, and Al-Kokobani means those who study or follow the planets. Bishop asked the elders of the tribe why they called themselves by such a name. They replied that it was because their ancestors followed the planets and traveled west to Palestine to show honor to the great prophet Jesus when he was born. So this is very interesting because this is a Muslim tribe and the wise men, this is not in the Quran, the birth of Jesus from the Virgin is, but the visit of the Magi, this is not an Islamic belief, it is not part of the Islamic scriptures, so it's interesting this tribe has a preserved memory of this, and maybe this is in fact a tradition handed down in this family, that this was the roots that grew from, or this is the tree that grew from the roots of this Magi. We don't really know. But uh, strangely, this group shows up to pay homage to Jesus, Matthew says. Look at verse 3. Now they show up where? They understand a king's been born in Judea, so where are they going to go? 
clearly to the capital. They would assume he's been born into the royal family. Well, verse 3, when King Herod heard this, that they showed up, he was disturbed in all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Magi was to be born. In Bethlehem of Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Okay, so here is an Old Testament prophecy that clearly does function actually as prediction that the Messiah, the descendant of David, who's going to rule, is going to be born in the town of Bethlehem. So they tell Herod this, and Herod tells the Magi this. Verse 7. Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me that I too may go and worship him. Yeah, that doesn't sound suspicious at all, does it? Um, we know Herod, from historical accounts, had a love of secret undercover agents. So it's no surprise that he arranges with the Magi to go and do this. Notice in verse uh, th- is it, what verse is it? Uh, three? Yes. It says, Herod was disturbed. This is Herod the Great. He was king for like 40 years over Judea. He was a terrible tyrant. And he himself was very paranoid about threats to the throne. And he himself was not Jewish. He was Idumean. So he was very vulnerable to an actual Jewish descendant from the proper royal family that could challenge him actually for rule of king. So he is dismayed by this. Verse 9, after they'd heard the king, the magi went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. Now, does that sound like normal star behavior to you? Okay, notice, they go to Bethlehem. They do not need a star to guide them to Bethlehem. They've showed up at Jerusalem, and Herod has told them the baby's born in Bethlehem. Bethlehem is like five or six miles from Jerusalem. They do not need a star to guide them to the town of Bethlehem. Where does the star guide them to, according to this verse? It went, until it went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. The next verse is going to say when they come to the house. So apparently this star somehow comes and marks out the specific house Jesus is in. Is this normal star behavior? No. How in the world is that going to work? If you stand in a certain way, okay, the star is over this house, takes 10 steps to the left. Is it still over the same house? No, right? This is not normal star behavior. So here's what I think is going on. I don't think this is a natural occurrence. I think this is a supernatural occurrence. In the ancient world, it was often thought that stars are divine beings. They are angels. And so it's very easy to have an interplay in the Bible between stars and supernatural divine beings. Let me show you an example. This is Job 38. Look on the screen. This is God speaking, talking talking about when he created. On what were its footings set, meaning the earth? Who laid its cornerstone? While the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy. Could be purely poetic, but the parallelism links the morning stars there with angels. And again, it's very common to think of stars as being angelic, sort of divine beings in ancient thinking. So my hunch is this is not normal star behavior. This is in fact something miraculous, probably an angel that is much lower than a normal star and is in fact miraculously guiding them to the house Jesus is in. Which means we're hard-pressed and probably wrong-headed to try to figure out because people try to figure out, okay, well, if they're in Jerusalem and they need to get to Bethlehem, like what stars would have been there and how could they have followed up through? I think it's probably wrong-headed. This is probably some sort of miraculous thing, which makes us question as well, what was it that the original Magi saw? Maybe it was normal star behavior. Maybe it was something completely different. And we may not be able to put together the pieces to figure out specifically astronomically what happened. Whatever. doesn't matter. The point is, supernaturally somehow, this star directs these magicians to this particular house that Jesus is in. Verse 11. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Those are very expensive cosmetics. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. So again, notice how strange. Gandalf, Dumbledore, and Merlin show up at the door and come in and bow down and worship Jesus, give gifts, and leave. Very curious. What is Matthew 
intending for us to see in this? Well, Matthew is going to show us by the end of the Gospel of Matthew who is the message of Jesus ultimately for. Just a few people or everybody? Everybody, right? And one of the things Matthew is going to show is how the, Matthew, how the message of Jesus comes to Israel but ends up being offered to all the nations. So at the end of Matthew, the Great Commission, go and make disciples of all nations. So likely what Matthew expects us to see here is this totally unexpected class of complete outsider. They're not Jewish. Uh, they're pagans. They don't even worship the same God. They're magic users, plausibly. And yet this extreme example of outsiders somehow get it. They show up being directed by God and they worship Jesus. This seems to be a clue early on in the story of Jesus that the message of Jesus is going to be for all people that will turn and repent and put their faith and trust in him. So here's a clue of the global mission and mandate that Jesus is going to accomplish. So, note as well, who directs the Magi into the scene here? Who's driving the star? God, right? God is directing this. But the coming of the Magi is going to mean a lot of trouble for all involved. So let's continue to see what happens here. That's part one, disruption. Occultists seek the king. Now here we go, part two, disaster. Jesus the refugee. Verse 13. When they, the Magi, had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So here's another challenge to Joseph. Last week we talked about a serious challenge to Joseph who was challenged to actually marry Mary despite the con- all the controversy that would have surrounded her pregnancy, to adopt, G- adopt Jesus, to establish his line of descent from David. Here we see another significant challenge to Joseph. In the middle of the night, the angel says, get up and go. Now I've been to the church in Cairo that commemorates the house where We are told Jesus and Mary and Joseph lived when they were in Egypt. Now, we don't know precisely that's the specific location, but it's somewhere there around Cairo, somewhere there around Egypt, surely. It's like 250 miles away. So that is like an angel waking you up in the middle of the night and saying, tonight, go walk to Rochester, Minnesota. Get it, go, get it together. Put a few things in a backpack, whatever possessions you can. We'll let you have like a mule or something and get out and go. What do you think? Middle of the night. That's a challenge, huh? That's a disruption. Think of the level of personal crisis. What do you have to leave behind? What are you able to bring? Well, off they go. Why Egypt? Well, actually, this is like the traditional place to go if you're an Israelite and you're in trouble in the Holy Land. Generations of of Jewish people have taken shelter in Egypt for a time. And in fact, in the first century, there's a massive population of Jews in Egypt, especially Alexandria. In fact, there were so many Jewish people living in the first century in Egypt, guess what they had done? They'd actually built themselves a replica of the temple in Jerusalem, and they would go bring sacrifices and worship Yahweh in that copy of the temple in Egypt. Now, they were not supposed to do that, according to the Old Testament, but they did it anyway. So this is a safe place to go. This is a place of refuge. This is a place of protection. And Mary and Joseph are told to go there. So verse 14, he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt. Did they even wait for breakfast? No, that's hardcore. Left for Egypt where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. So what do you think they used to financially support themselves? Yeah, notice that. That the gifts the Magi brought would have been at hand, easily gold, frankincense, and myrrh, which could have been sold to support them on this journey. Okay, so in terms of personal crisis, disaster, disruption to life, imagine this. Uprooted in the middle of the night to flee violence to live in a foreign country. We have a term for this category of people. What is it? Refugee, right? Notice again how fascinating that Jesus is not brought forth in the palace with a silver spoon in his mouth, born into a poor family among an oppressed people, and almost immediately is forced to flee as a refugee. His very existence is born into a situation that's very precarious. So I make an observation on this. I don't know if you've noticed, but over the last five, six years, seven years, there's really been an international crisis of refugees. 
When I went to Greece a few years ago, we saw them everywhere as Europe was flooded by so many people fleeing war in Africa and in Syria and other such places. I'm reminded that our Lord Jesus himself was a refugee. And so my suggestion to us as believers, we must think about that very carefully. And we must very, be very careful in the way we think about and speak about, for example, this class of people called refugee, the down and outers, the oppressed, the victims, the poor. If we trace God's emphasis and what is said about God and the values of God through the whole storyline in the Bible, he routinely is found on the side of the alien, the outsider, the outcast, the oppressed, and the poor. And so the very fact that Jesus was a refugee should make us very sympathetic and make us very open to doing whatever we can to help those who are oppressed, those who are suffering, those who are fleeing as refugees, as in fact Jesus himself did. Now, characteristically, Matthew is going to find some touch point in Scripture to connect here. This is what he does five times through the story of Jesus' birth. He takes five passages and shows a connection between us, an event in the story of Jesus and something prefigured in the Old Testament. Okay, so notice in our verse 14. He goes to Egypt till the death of Herod. So was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. This is an Old Testament passage. This is Hosea 11.1. 1. Now Matthew says the flight to Egypt fulfills this passage, and you know what? That sounds real good until we actually go and look at that passage. If you sit down with a Jewish rabbi and you try to open your Bible to Hosea 11.1 1 and tell him that here is a prediction that Jesus was going to flee and go to Egypt, he will laugh you out of the room. Let me show you what I mean. Look on the screen. Here's Hosea 11.1. 1. God says this, When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt I called my son. In that passage, who is God's son? The nation of Israel. Right? When did God call his son Israel out of Egypt? What is God talking about here? He's talking about the Exodus. When God saved them and delivered them out of Egypt. Notice, this passage in Hosea, this is not a prediction of any kind. It's not a statement about the future at all. This is actually a statement that God is making about the past. He said, out of Egypt I called my son. He goes back and reflects on the Exodus as God delivered the nation of Israel out of bondage in Egypt. And look how it goes on in the next verse. The more they, Israel, were called, the more they went away from me. The more God pursued Israel, the more unfaithful they became, God says. So is that in any way a prediction of Jesus' career of fleeing to Egypt in the future? No. So here we see one of our clearest examples that Matthew and other New Testament writers will use the language of fulfillment in ways beyond a simple prediction and fulfillment. This is not a prediction that Jesus is going to do anything. Nonetheless, Matthew says this is done in fulfillment of that, what's going on. Well, again, most of the time, at least more of the time, often than not, in the New Testament, the New Testament writers will speak of this kind of fulfillment as not a prediction that gets fulfilled, but rather the repetition of a pattern, right? So Matthew sees in Jesus a repetition of this pattern. Jesus, Matthew will argue, is the true Israel, is the true people of God, if you will, the true son of God. He thinks, wow, you know what? Way back when, when God took his son Israel out of Egypt in the Exodus, well, now look at this. Here is Jesus, God's son, in a whole different sense, a whole real, more significant sense. And he too went into Egypt and out. And so there is a repetition of the pattern of what God did in Israel in the Old Testament, now repeated with a kind of heightening in the career of Jesus. And Matthew will show in the Gospel of Matthew again that Jesus is true Israel. Israel. He is God's true son. And so those people that are connected to Jesus become part of God's people because of who Jesus is, not because of ethnic lines or religious obedience or this sort of thing. Everything matters about being connected with Jesus, his son. So again, this isn't a prediction of Jesus. Rather, this is Matthew recognizing Jesus is fulfilling a pattern that God had established in the Old Testament that is now being repeated in the life of Jesus. Okay? Just nod your heads up and down. All right. So that's part one. Disruption, occultists seek the king. Part two, disaster, Jesus the refugee. Now it gets worse. Part three, destruction, the holy innocence 
This is the traditional term used of this incident, the holy innocence. Verse 16, when Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and in its vicinity who were two years old and under in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Clearly, here's the darkest part of the Christmas story. Here's the clearest reminder that despite the fact that Jesus, the Savior, has been born in the world, the light is here, what remains? The worst kind of darkness, the worst kind of evil, the worst kind of slaughter, and crime and violence. Now, some people have questioned this and said, well, this didn't really happen. This is the Christians just making up stuff again. So just like Moses was saved out of Egypt from a tyrant, so now Jesus can escape a tyrant. It's just the Christians being creative. Well, yeah, maybe. But this really does match precisely what we know of the savagery of Herod the Great. Like, this guy was brutal. And he was very paranoid about challenges to his throne. And, and he killed people and asked questions later. And he particularly was going mad by the end of his life, which he's about at the end of his life here. Listen, Herod the Great, guys, he killed his brother-in-law. He killed his mother-in-law. He killed his favorite wife, Marianne, because he thought she had betrayed him. He really hadn't. He killed his three oldest sons because he thought they were conspiring against him. This apparently led the great Roman emperor, Caesar Augustus, to comment wryly, it is better to be Herod's pig than to be Herod's son. To let you know how insane he was at the end of his life, when he was on his deathbed and he was about to die in about 4 BC, he knew he was going to die and he wanted to be, for people to be sad when he died. And he knew he was kind of hated. He wanted people to mourn at his death. And so he gave orders to round up family members of all the leading Jewish families, hundreds of them. He had them put in prison with orders that when I die, you kill them all. And so they'll be weeping and mourning all across the land so that I will be properly mourned. Now thankfully... When he died, everyone was like, eh, let's just let him out, which they did. So thankfully, no one went through with that. But that gives you the idea of the maniac that we were dealing with here. So this is very much in keeping with Herod. Now, sure, we don't have any historical record of this happening outside the Bible, but that's not super surprising. Bethlehem's a little village. How many people would be living there? People estimate, and they figured this would involve maybe 20 little boys, ages two and under, which is savage which is brutal, but is merely a blip on the radar compared to the atrocities in the first century. So it's no surprise we don't have record of this outside the Bible. And yet, this is 20 little, little baby boys, two years old, a year and a half, one year old, infants, 20 little babies, 20 families or so uh, with a kid killed. Like I mentioned, we put together a guide for a Christmas Eve service, and the main presentation in there is an 11-minute poem and a presentation focusing in on this very thing, the slaughter of the innocents, with some creative liberties, but calculated and designed to help us emotionally grapple with the brutality of what this would be. So brace yourselves for that on Christmas Eve. Um, yes. As we'd expect, Matthew ties this to some kind of fulfillment in the Bible. So look at verse 17. At the slaughter of these children, the death of these babies, then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Okay, by now you will not be surprised to hear that neither is this a prediction of what was going to happen in Jesus' life. This is one of the saddest laments. Uh, Jeremiah, um, Matthew quotes this verse of Jeremiah, one of the saddest poems reflecting grief and loss in the Old Testament. The context here is a poem, a lament offered up as God's people, Judea, are driven off into exile. Babylonian has invaded. The people are enslaved and brought out into exile. The little village of Rama was where the captives were stationed and staged as they went out into exile. And Jeremiah picturesquely picturesques, uh, pictures Rachel here. Rachel was one of the mothers of the sons of Jacob, one of the mothers of the tribes of Israel. She's long dead, but it's like her, the great ancestor. She's there aware of this weeping and mourning as she sees her descendants, her children, going off into exile. Now, where was Rachel buried? Anybody know? Big points to you if you do. Huh? Bethlehem! Well done. Bible scholars here. Yes. Look at this. Genesis 35, 19. 
Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrathah, that is Bethlehem. Over her tomb, Jacob set a pillar, and to this day, that pillar marks Rachel's tomb. So it's as though Matthew imagines that the long-dead matriarch Rachel is somehow present there in Bethlehem, watching, seeing this, and weeping and mourning as her children, her great-great-great-grandchildren, are murdered. Merry Christmas. So is the profound evil, violence, destruction, murder, and slaughter in the world any surprise to God? Matthew shows here is biblical precedent for atrocities done to children. This doesn't take God by surprise. It is part of the brokenness and the profound evil that is with us, has always been with us, and will be with us until something changes. Now it is true that if we are perceptive readers, as Matthew maybe expects us to be, we'll notice something. He quotes here Jeremiah 31. Does that ring any bells? Turns out that very sad lament is the dark moment in a chapter that is actually full of hope. Look what Jeremiah writes in the verse right after that lament on the screen. This is what the Lord says. Restrain your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears, for your work will be rewarded, declares the Lord. They will return from the land of the enemy. So there is hope for your descendants, declares the Lord. Your children will return to their own land. And it goes on to prophesy the coming of a new covenant, which in fact Jesus himself comes to fulfill. So even though there's the lament, even though there's the pain, even though there's the death, accordingly there is this note of hope built into this citation as well as Matthew is fully aware and connects the coming of this hope with what Jesus is going to do. So in the midst of despair, death, injustice, murder, hardship, suffering, there is this line of hope in what Christ comes to bring. But even though that Jesus is here and has accomplished his work that he has done so far, this does not mean we are immune to any of these things. Okay, so bottom line for us. Let's put it this way. While Christ has not yet undone evil and suffering, the decisive work is done. The kingdom is coming, so hold on. I mean, this is the mix of the Christmas story. Light is dawned, hope for the world, light to enlighten the Gentiles, the people in darkness have seen a great light, scripture is fulfilled, and also dead, murdered children. Right? Both of hope, evil, despair. We are still caught here. Jesus has done his great work of death and resurrection, but we await the final resolution of all this. So 20 babies dead in Bethlehem. Well, it's not so different than what the world has always been and what it continues to be. Two examples for you. 1968, so-called My Lay Massacre in Vietnam. Many people don't know about this. U.S. American soldiers murdered, tortured, raped, and assaulted between 300 and 500 unarmed Vietnamese villagers, mostly women and children. Not a single fighting age man in the entire village. 182 women, 17 of which were pregnant. 173 children, mostly machine gunned. It only stopped when another American helicopter pilot on on a reconnaissance mission happened to notice what was going on, landed his helicopter between the retreating villagers and the other American troops and threatened to fire on the American troops if they didn't back off. Hey, we did that. How about this? Last year, 2019, Easter Sunday, bombs go off in Christian churches all across Sri Lanka. 250 people killed in those churches. At least 45 killed. Islamic terrorists in that case. And on and on it goes. Muslims have done it. Atheists have done it. Communists have done it. Christians have done it. Americans have done it. And on and on it rolls. While Christ has not yet undone evil and suffering. The decisive work is done. The kingdom is coming, so we must hold on. We're still in between. The light of Christ and his work is here, but we await the final fulfillment. So three suggestions here. First of all, accordingly, not being surprised by the worst of evil and tragedy. Like, let's not be surprised by this. It's right there all throughout the Bible. God's people have always suffered. 
And the story of God's people has often been death, suffering, bloodshed. Let's not be surprised by this. The world is inescapably broken. And we are not immune to this just because Jesus has been born. We're not immune to it just because Jesus has died on the cross for our sins and has been raised again. We still await the final resolution of this. Notice, Jesus was spared by the angel, right? The angel came to Joseph and said, get out of Bethlehem, right? And baby Jesus was safe, right? Baby Jesus was saved, agreed? Isn't that cool? Well, why didn't an angel warn the parents of the other 20 families in Bethlehem? Could an angel have warned them? Yeah. Sometimes God saves. Lots of times, people just die. So let's not be surprised by this. This is part of the reality of the world we find ourselves in. Second, well, I guess, I guess though, we want to say this. This is also, at the same time, part of the Christian answer to this. As Bart Ehrman acknowledges, actually. Because, look, one piece of the Christian answer to the problem of evil and suffering is this. Who gets born? Christ Jesus. Where does he get born? Into what circumstances? Suffering. Yeah, the angel saved baby Jesus on his birthday. Did the angel save Jesus from going to the cross? No, he suffered and died there. So notice, part of the Christian answer to the problem of evil and suffering is is that God did not stay aloof. He did not stay distant. He did not stay separate and untouched by all of this. Amazingly, he condescended and gave of himself and became one of us, born into a poor family, among an oppressed people, refugees, rejected, hunted, tortured, and executed. That God himself willingly entered into the worst of our suffering and death and amazingly turned that very mechanism around in an upside-down kind of way and used this to defeat evil as he comes back to life in the resurrection. So this is part of the Christian answer to suffering. And it's very powerful to see in Jesus the face of God who suffers as one of us. Second, accordingly, by awaiting God's final answer to evil, Christ's return. Now, we have a lot of good answers we can give to the problem of evil. I've recommended you a great book in your outlines by a guy named Tim Keller. He writes a fantastic book, Wrestling with the Problem of Evil and Suffering. He makes the point that actually the problem of evil and suffering, far from being a problem for Christianity, is actually one of the strong points of the Christian faith, as the Christian faith is able to uniquely provide far better answers to the problem of evil and suffering than other religions and worldviews. So he does a great job of spinning it on its head. And yet... It may be at some level that the final piece of our answer to the problem of suffering and evil we will not be able to give until the day if and when Christ finally returns. And we trust he will. If Christ really comes back and defeats all evil, if he really raises the dead and does away with evil, suffering, and death forever, then we'll be able to say, okay, now we see. It may be that the final part of our answer we await We wait confidently because we recognize that God himself entered into this evil and in the resurrection, the defeat of evil and the restoration of all things has begun and it absolutely will be completed because it has begun in Christ. And so we await his return. Till then, we may always have a little question mark. Third, in the meantime, by helping the poor and the oppressed... This is part of the heart of God. This is part of the calling of a Christian. And just to wrap up, I want to read Bart Ehrman's, I forgot to do this first service, but we were a little over time, so it's probably good I forgot. I just want to read you his last couple lines in here as he wrestles with this and explains why he's no longer a Christian because of the, evil of, the problem of evil and suffering. But listen to how he ends this book. We should work hard to make our world the most pleasing place it can be for others. Whether this means visiting a friend in the hospital, giving more to a local charity, or an international relief effort, volunteering at the local soup kitchen, voting for politicians more concerned with the suffering in the world and with their own political futures, or expressing our opposition to the violent oppression of innocent people, what we have in the here and now is all there is. Okay, we disagree with him on that one. We need to live life to the fullest and help others as well as to enjoy the fruit of the land. In the end, we may not have ultimate solutions to life's problems. We may not know the whys and wherefores. But just because we don't have an answer to suffering does not mean we cannot have a response to it. Our response should be to work to alleviate suffering wherever possible and to live life as well as we can. Well, amen, Bart. We mostly agree. Except we disagree that this life is not all there is. 
But precisely for us, because this life is not all there is, we share that commitment and should share it even more as we follow the Savior who suffered and gave himself to such degree for the sake of others. All right, so that's our passage today. Three parts to this. Part one, disruption. Occultists seek the king as these magi so unexpectedly come to pay homage to Jesus. Part two, disaster. Jesus, the refugee. God bringing these magi utterly disrupts the personal life of the holy family and they must flee uh, as refugees to Egypt. And part three, destruction. The holy innocence, the darkest point of the Christmas story, scattered with dead children as just a fresh reminder of the darkness in the evil that remains with us and makes us long for the final return of Christ and salvation from all of this. Bottom line, we said, while Christ has not yet underdone evil and suffering, the decisive work is done in his death and resurrection. The kingdom is coming. Hold on. And if you want to read two excellent books on this theme of suffering and evil from a Christian perspective, I've given you two recommendations there on the back of your outline. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you that in the face of evil, in the face of suffering, in the face of tragedy, in in the face of death, we have hope that you, in the person of Christ, entered into this, drank fully from the cup of suffering and death, spun it around, defeated death in the resurrection, and one day will return to restore all things. We ask you, God, to speed that day. We ask you to send Christ quickly, bring the kingdom, and until then, we pray that our lives will be marked by faithfulness to you and dependence on the Spirit as we seek to represent you here in this world until that day. And it's in his name we pray, amen.